So welcome back this week. How many of you have been participating in our three-week series? Yeah, that's based on the three faces of God. It's an idea that um, was articulated through Ken Wilber. He is a mystic. He is a philosopher. He's a writer that will thoroughly confuse you. It goes so deep that it goes deep and then still takes you off the deep end. But there's a part of something that he read that really caught me. And it's called The Three Faces of God. And then uh, another, uh, or a minister, the Reverend Paul Smith, took this and he even took it a step further. Now, so what does this mean when we talk about the three faces of God? It has to do with the fundamental understanding of perspective. You know, all of us have our unique perspective. And we, we view things through our point of view. We may remember that you, you learned in school there's something called first person point of view or first person voice, first person perspective, that's the I. And then there's the second person perspective, which is the you, I talk to you. And then there's the third person perspective, which is the it or the that or, or whatever. And so that we are the first and we can talk with and to the second and we can talk about and experience the third. So when we look at these, we've been looking at these the past week because this is the fundamental understanding of perspective. But it doesn't just apply to certain areas of our life, it applies to all areas of our life, which would then have to include spirituality. So the question then becomes, is there a way to relate to the unnameable, the undefinable, that which we call God, all that is, using these three perspectives? And that's what this, this series has been about, is looking at God through the, the first person perspective. Would you give me these slides? So we look at, if we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus talked about God, Jesus talked to God and with God, and then Jesus identified as God. These are the very three same fundamental perspectives that we're talking about. And so if we go to the next slide, you can sort of extrapolate that and say, well, if you're looking and considering God, the infinite, and the third person, then that is God, all that is, the God that is the great web of life, the ground of all being, the fabric, the essence of all that is. That is God that we may call beyond us. It's in all of life. And then the second perspective is God beside me. It makes God very intimate. We talked about this last week. And today we talk about the first person perspective, the I am, that God in us. And I'm very, um, I want to be very clear in saying that this is not an either or, that this is all. The goal is to be able to hold an understanding and grow in our relationship to all that is through using this language. And what Ken Wilber pointed out is that through his study of all the religious traditions and spiritual traditions, almost none, very few of them embraced all three of these. Um, for example, in traditional Christianity, you will hear some about God as the great creator, but you will hear a whole lot about God as the other. God is the thou. We pray to God, uh, ask and receive, seek and find. And in some ways it appears to almost make that God outside of us because the way the language sounds, we're, we're approaching this as a me and you, an I, I and a thou, I and the beloved. And because of that, unity has sort of distanced ourselves from the second face of God and embraced the, third and the, the first and the third. In New Thought Churches, you'll hear a lot about God as the infinite all that is, and you'll also hear a lot about God as the I am, the, the eternal witness, the I amness within us. You'll hear almost nothing about that in a traditional Christian church. And whether it's um, Sufi, whether it's Baha'i, uh, whether it's Islam, if you begin to study those, you'll realize that very rarely... Do you see a comfortable embracing and languaging and understanding God in all of those ways? And yet, I believe that it's fundamental. And so what this series is allowing us to do is really explore it. Which ones are we more likely to use? What's more comfortable? And are there areas that we could really deepen um, our, our own personal understanding if we embraced more of these? Ernest Holmes, who's the founder of um, Centers for Spiritual Living, he wrote the book, Science of Mind. He said in the philosophy of Jesus, God is all there is. That's God in the third, per third person. Then he said, God is right where I am. That's God in the second person. And then he said, I am one with God. 
That's what we're talking about today, that I am one with God. Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, said it this way, God is creator, infinite, eternal. God is person, God is not person, but God is principle. That's God in the third, all that is. But he also said, God is approachable, available to all who draw nigh unto him. We see, that almost sounds confusing because he just said God is not person but principle so he's saying both as well and then he said God is the indwelling life within us so these mystical teachers in the foundations of new thought taught the same thing that God is all that is God is our comfort, our companion, our guide, that we can commune and literally have a relationship and a dialogue with that which we call God. But then don't ever forget that God is the innermost aspect of our being, that all of these things are true. And in unity, when we talk about God within, we tend to use the word Christ to describe that. But it's just one word trying to point to a dimension of our being that is the very beingness of God within us. Charles Fillmore, again, co-founder of Unity, said, each of us has within him or her the Christ, just as Jesus did. And we must look within to recognize and realize our sonship, our divine origin and birth, even as he did, and continually unifying ourselves with the highest. Now, in other languaging, so unity calls it the Christ, this divine aspect. So Christian mystics have called it the Christ within. Buddhists may call it your Buddha nature or the no-self, that which is beyond any self. Hindus call it the Atman. Others may call it divine spark, the imprisoned splendor, the eternal I am. I want you to listen to the definition from Hinduism of Atman. Atman is the immortal aspect of the mortal existence. It is the self hidden within all creation. It is the microcosm representing the macrocosm that is within all, imparting to us divine qualities and possibilities and providing us with the reason to exist and experience life. Atman is Brahman itself, or Atman is God itself, the very self which informs, infills, and incarnates to participate in life. I can't think of a better definition for the Christ, and yet that comes from the Hindu uh, definition of the Atman. So I hope you see that there's many ways of pointing to what we're talking about as the I am, that, is, that which is within us, that which is absolutely a part of, we, of what we are, of all that we are, and yet it is so much more than what we may call just the ego self or the emotional self or the thinking self or the mental self. There's, there's more wholeness to us than all the individual parts. And I hope that by the end of uh, our time together today, that may make a little bit more sense to you. In this book, Unity, A Quest for Truth, Eric Butterworth, who was a great unity minister and writer, he, um, he tells this story. He said, a child was stretching out on the floor with paper and crayons. Her mother asked, what are you drawing, dear? I am drawing a picture of God, said the child. But no one knows what God looks like, replied the mother. Continuing to dash her crayon at the paper with abandon, without interruption, the child simply said, well, they will when I get through. <laughs> <laughs> he writes, this is our work to outpicture God, to fulfill God's likeness on earth that as it is in heaven, so shall it be on earth. You see, the great alchemists knew that they weren't trying to turn metal into gold. They were trying to turn humanness into spirit. They were trying to turn what we may consider and view as an ordinary existence into a channel of extraordinary presencing. That that's what we really are when we begin to understand that dimension of ourself. He goes on to write that we all ask, what is God? Here we are faced with a definition that can only limit the limitless. We could say God is mind, God is life, God is substance, God is all that is. But whatever we say, let us not forget, God is you. This may seem shocking to many to think yourself as God. But we did not say you are God. We said God is you. Just as all ice is water, but not all water is ice. Whatever your life is, it is God. 
The life in you is God life. The wisdom in you is God intelligence. And the love in you is God love. You're a child of God, an expression of God, all that is. There can be nothing of you that is not innately of God. You are created as a perfect idea in God mind. And your purpose in life is to outpicture this idea in expression. That's what it means to really understand that all that we are is an expression of all that is. And that we are so much more than meets the eye. That life is, is always asking us, you know, do you know who you are? That comes in lots of different ways. Do you know who you are? There's a story of a professor who was teaching a class. The class was basically on birds. And a young man signed up for this class because he needed this. was the last class. He absolutely had this so that he could graduate. And he really studied. He did everything he could. He had a high average. He wanted to maintain that. He had been doing well. And so it comes time for the final exam. And the final exam, he gets it and he looks at it and he cannot believe what he sees. Because it's five bird heads and five sets of bird legs. And it simply says, identify and match up the appropriate bird. And he looks at this and he goes to the professor and he said, did I get the wrong page? And the professor said, no, that's the test. He said, you have got to be kidding. I can tell you any fact or anything. I've studied hard, but this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And the professor looked at him and the, and the young man just went on. And the professor said, excuse me, you're being quite defensive. He said, who are you? Can you identify yourself? And the young man said, you tell me who I am. <laughs> so he picked up his, <laughs> showed him his leg. So in one way or another, knowing who we are, being able to identify ourselves, we're always being asked that question. There's a funny story in the Sufi tradition. If any of you have studied in the writings of the Sufi, there's a character that is often used called Nazaruddin. And Nazaruddin is known as the, um, the wise fool. He shows up in all kinds of different places doing foolish things, but bringing forth incredible wisdom. And some of you may know the story where um, in this particular reading, Nazaruddin has received this very large check. And so he goes to a big bank in New York to cash the check. But now Nazaruddin looks like someone that just walked away from Woodstock. He's just burnt out, old kind of hippie look. And so he walks into this New York bank, big check, hands it to the teller and says, I want to cash this. The teller looks at the check looks at him, looks at the check, looks at him and said, well, sir, in order to cash this check, I'll need you to be able to identify yourself. And he looks around and he reaches in his pocket and he fumbles and the teller again says, sir, I'll need you to identify yourself to cash this check. And he said, well, wait, wait, wait just a minute. So he runs over to a, a woman who's in a line with another teller. And he asks her something, and now she's digging through her purse. And, and, and the teller over here is thinking, what is this crazy guy doing? And the woman hands him something, and he comes back, and she just says, Sir, I need you to identify yourself if you want this check cashed. And so he wipes it off, and he pulls out a mirror. And he shines it, and he said, Yep, this is who I am, Nazaruddin. <laughs> that identifying yourself, knowing who you are, is one of the most important things because who we know ourselves to be determines how we show up. Who we know ourselves to be determines what we believe is possible for us. Who we know ourselves to be determines what we believe is capable and available to us. That's why so often in the scriptures, Jesus would use stories like, like the story of the prodigal son, where this this, this young man who his father was wealthy and he has everything and yet he asked his father for his, his inheritance. Give me all that I've got. And even though he was the youngest son, the father still gave this young boy the inheritance that was due to him, which was really a disrespectful to the father in that tradition. And as the story goes, you know, the young man goes off and, and it says he, he loses it with riotous living, a.k.a. Um, drug, sex, and rock and roll, I think is what it may uh, equate to in, in our language. So he goes off and he spends the money, he blows all the money, and he realizes now he has no friends, he has no money, he has no means to make ends meet. So he finds a job working for a pig farmer. 
Now here's a Jewish boy where even being around pig, they're not even supposed to touch a football in his time. So even being around that was something that was not kosher, so to speak. But he finds himself there feeding the pigs and actually eating some of the husks that they were eating. And the, and the scripture says that one day he came to himself. He said, my father is a rich man and I have disgraced my father and, and I dare not go back and ask to be his son again, but I would be so much better off if I could be one of his servants. And so as the story goes, he begins to make that long journey back. And just as he's beginning to make his way back to the father's house, the story says that his father is there at the edge of the property waiting for him. And as he walks up to his father, he says, Father, I'm sorry. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I've, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nowhere in the scripture does it say his father forgave him. It simply says he grabbed him and hugged him and said, My son who was lost is now found. Welcome home. And he, he puts, he puts a, a coat around him. He puts fine shoes on him. And he begins to throw a big party for this young man. Well, the father didn't need to forgive him because this father represents the part of us that recognizes and sees us as the I am. And what was the story was being told so that the audience of the time may come to understand what Jesus was saying is claim your divine inheritance, that you're all expressions of God. People then who had been born into a caste system, some people who were, were blessed and some were unblessed, some were considered holy, some were considered unholy. You had to follow some 600 laws to be worthy and acceptable in the eyes of God. And in the face of all of that, he just said, I want you to know who you are, that you are an expression of God just like you are. And he presenced this I am presence. This dimension of us that is more than the, than the ego self. This aspect of us that is growing us and molding us from the inside in, out. It, it's, it causes us to be loving and compassionate. But it brings out things in us that we didn't even know we have. And the I am presence is not just, you know, when I first found my way to New Thought and I began to, I grew up Pentecostal, so when I began to hear these things about God within you, that was foreign to me. And I began to sort of visualize it like a little chocolate chip somewhere in a cookie. And if I could just find that part of me and activate it, I'd be okay. Well, I've come to understand that it's not a little part of us, it's a dimension of us. That it's, it's an aspect of what we already are. But it's a matter of growing into the awareness of it. So when we ask this week, is your God you enough? We've talked about, is your God big enough? Is your God close enough? This week, is your God you enough? Meaning, can you find yourself? Do you see yourself in God? And do you see God in yourself? And do you recognize and anchor your awareness in an identity that is more than meets the eye? Do you know that there is a power and a presence in you that can grow you and, and live through you? When, when the followers were around Jesus, they followed him, I believe, for one reason. Now, if someone came into your life and they said, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God, you may say, interesting, or you may say, you need to be locked up. But you probably would pay attention. Because just because they said, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God, quite frankly, that doesn't mean anything. If they came to you and said, oh, I'm a great healer, I'm a great mystic, I'm a great psychic, I'm a great this, you may say, that's interesting. But if they start embodying it and presencing it, you're going to pay attention. What happened in the time, I believe, of Jesus and the Buddha and, and some of these, Sai Baba, some of these great mystical teachers, is they embodied and had the awareness of who they were so activated and in the forefront of their consciousness that it presenced them, it flowed through them, and people felt it. It was a palpable sense. There was something palpable. And to be in the presence of someone like that is to experience what's called entrainment. It begins to quicken you. You begin to feel it. You begin to know that truth for yourself. That's kind of what cre gets created in here on Sunday, sort of this feel that um, one of you told me one time, if I got any happier on Sundays, I'd levitate. Well, it's because of what gets created in here collectively. It's about shifting into that awareness of all that we are as an expression of all that is. So when we ask, is our God close enough? 
It begins with awareness. All change, when it comes to changing oneself, it must begin with self-awareness. Being aware of ourself and the impact that we have. There's a story to me that um, illustrates this in a sort of a delightful way. It talks about a young man named Danny McDonald from uh, the Scottish Isle of Skye. It says, Danny went to an English university and was living in the hall of residence with all the other students there. After he had been there a month, his mother came to visit him. How do you find your English students, Danny? she asked. Mother, he replied, they're such noisy people, these English. The one on that side literally bangs his head against the wall. The one on that side yells at all different times. And the one above me stomps on the floor as if trying intentionally to disturb me. Oh, Donald, his mother said, how do you manage to put up with these awful, noisy English neighbors? Mother, I do nothing. I do what I always do. I just ignore them and I stay here quietly playing me bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that's a coincidence. <laughs> Glad to have you here today, Donald. This is Clifford, really, but we'll let him be Donald today. <laughs> Self-awareness is the beginning, is the key. You know, it's a funny story because sometimes we're doing things and we're upset about what other people are doing, paying no attention all the while to what we are doing. Well, this, the great I am that is within us begins to work with us through the avenue of self-awareness. Who do you know yourself to be? How are you showing up? Are you bumping into your own self? Are there things that are irritating you? If they are, we probably need to get that mirror back out and find out what is it within me? What is it within me that's being triggered by this, that's finding this as an irritant? It's all about... Um, always going back within and taking accountability and responsibility. That's the level at which it begins. And then it's about having our awareness, so our awareness anchored in a God self-identity of knowing that we are more than meets the eye, that there's a power and a presence that we can use. You know, when sometimes when people first find unity and new thought or start uh, reading angel books, how many of you have ever tried to manifest a parking space? Come on, confess. <laughs> I still do. We'll, I'll start playing, but praying before I get to downtown Nashville. Okay, angels, help me out. I need a parking space. You know, we've, you've kind of learned that if you, you can align with things and things begin to line up. So there's a power and a presence that you can use. And there's a power and a presence that uses you. You see, having our awareness anchored in a sense of our God self having our consciousness anchored in that sense of God self and having our presencing anchored in a sense of God self. You see, I believe Jesus and other master teachers so presenced God that people thought they were gods. But they were no more divine than you or me. Perhaps they were more anchored in the awareness of their divinity. And the more we draw from that, the more we pay attention to how we're being selfish, how we're being unloving, where we're being critical, where we're trying to fix things and we're frustrated and we're not knowing how to surrender and to allow this greater presence to take over and to heal us and to use us. <clears throat> when I was in seminary, one of the practicums that we had, we had to every student had to spend 10 weeks partner with a hospital working as a ho working and training as a hospital chaplain it was part of the whole uh, four-year program I put mine off until the third year as long as I could because I was not excited about training to be a hospital chaplain that was just not an environment that that I felt like I would enjoy and so we would go through these in groups of about 12 people and and there was something interesting happening. All the other people who went through this program didn't seem to have any problems. But for example, we had three hospitals where we could be assigned. And I got assigned to Mission Hospital in downtown Kansas City, which was like the most challenging, worst, had the most incredible things happen. 
And they would be there all night, never get called. I'd be there all night and be up all night. So I'm like, what is with this? The first time I worked there, a meth lab in Kansas City blew up. So I spent the whole night in the hospital tending with people. Well, the uh, prayer chaplain in charge said, well, you do know what you resist persist. <laughs> I wanted to <laughs> kick him, but I, I, I realized, and I would just get knots in my stomach when I had to do this. And I began to pay attention. What was it? Well, you know what it was? I felt like I didn't have what was needed. I would go into these rooms and a person would be there with a child who was dying and they'd look at me and say, why is God doing this? I don't know. I'd go into the next room and something happened and the person would say, why would God allow this? I don't know. I'd go somewhere else and it would just be this horrific thing. And I... I didn't want to lie. I didn't want to make stuff up. I didn't want to just say, well, it's probably God's will. And there's a, because this is not how I'm wired. I had to find my own. And so I was honest. I was meeting people where I was. I would say things like, you know, I don't know. But what I do believe, there's more to this life than meets the eye. What I do believe is there are qualities like love and peace and things that can still be present. What I do believe is that healing happens and even we don't understand how it happens, it can happen. And little by little, pe you know, people respond. I didn't even really notice they were responding. And I, I would tell the person in charge of the prayer chaplain uh, thing when he would say, well, how did it go? I'd say, well, I just listened or I just that. And he said, no, you were presencing love. You were presencing your truth. You were presencing what you could. And I began to understand that's the greatest gift we can give because it was me coming to the edge of my I don't know. I almost quit because I felt like I don't have all the answers. I don't have what it takes. I don't know. I believe our world could use a real big dose of I don't know. I don't know. And stop making stuff up that, that <laughs> and, and creating more mess, you know, just stop, stop making stuff up. But to say, I don't know. And when we're willing to stand in that space, that's when the great I am, that's when we've made room. That's when we learn to hold on and let go. I don't know, but I'm not giving up but I'm going to hold on. And so for me, the, the, the pivotal point of this was towards the end of my prayer chaplaincy. One night I was sleeping at the hospital and about two o'clock in the morning, I get paged, get called into a room and it's a, a woman who has lung cancer and is just really struggling and it's very clear, it appeared very clear that she was not going to be there for many more breaths. And her husband was by her side and he was an absolute mess. He was almost yelling, hold on, hold on, hold on. And as soon as I walked in, and they said, you know, the, the prayer chaplain is here, and I saw that, I immediately began to pray inside because I did not know what to do. I did not know what to say, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning when you just wake up. I, I did not know me, Darlene. But the man asked me to step outside and we stepped outside and he began to pour his heart out to me and say, you know, this woman has been through this one time. She, she survived and she's counting on me. How can I possibly tell her to let go? But she's standing there and laying there and she's in such horrible pain. How can I possibly not let her go? But I can't. I can't say, hold on. And I can't say, let go. I don't know what to do. And the whole time I've been praying and I literally felt a sensation at the top of my her head and the words came through, can you tell her you trust her? Can you tell her you trust her? And I looked at him and I said, can you tell your wife you trust her? And he went in the room and he held her hands and he said, baby, I trust you. And she died. And the family began to come in and he said, that chaplain told me to tell her I trusted her and it all worked out. Well, I didn't say, I said, tell her, can you trust her? And that's what he said. But I, what I learned was, it's in those times, I didn't think of that. 
I didn't know that ahead of time. I would have never in my life thought that. But I hope I never in my life forget that. And it was so humbling for me because what I learned is that if we hold on and let go, there's a dimension of God, there's a dimension of all that we are, this I amness that will use us, that will speak through us, that will show up at just the right time, in just the right way, with just the right words, with just the right inspiration, with whatever it is that we need. Richard, would you give me that song very softly? How many of you have experienced something like that? That you don't know where it comes from, it just comes. That's the dimension of who we are. And so I think our world is asking us to, to learn to hold on and let go to anchor our awareness right here in earth. I am Darlene, I am this person. I have many identities, things that I, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a, I'm a partner, I'm a minister, I'm a singer. Many of you could name all these things, but they're just aspects of us. We're so much more than this. And that part of us that is so much more than this is the part of us that changes us, that evolves us, that heals us, that presences through us. Two stories I want to share about change. How many of you remember Al Capone? Al Capone virtually owned Chicago, the, the mobster. He was notorious for enmeshing that, Cindy and every, that city and everything from um, bootleg booze to prostitution to murder. He owned the city, he owned people, and it, it was very corrupt. Well, Al Capone was able to do what he did so long because he had a, a, a lawyer called Fast Eddie. He was called Fast Eddie because he was a fast-talking lawyer. He was brilliant, and he managed to keep Al Capone out of jail for years. But he had to be very dishonest to do that. Well, he did it because he, was, he had a big ego. I'm a great lawyer. He did it because he was proud of Al Capone gave him a home that they said was as large, so large that it filled an entire Chicago city block. He lived a big life. And Fast Eddie and Al Capone, no one, people wondered would they ever change. Well, Fast Eddie eventually had a son. And people realized when he had a son, he did have a soft spot because he loved his son. And what began to happen is Al Capone's little boy began to grow up. He began to imitate his father. He began to do the things that his father did. He began to play with guns. He began to act out. And, and, and uh, Fast Eddie had an opportunity to look and say, this, I don't want my son to imitate this part of me. And how can I grow my son up in this home and do what I'm doing and expect him to be other, anything other than what I am? And it took a couple of years, but his love for his son so changed him. Love is what changes us. His love for his son so changed him that he decided that the only way he could ever get out of what he was doing is if he went to the police and cooperated with them so that they could catch Al Capone. So that's just what he did. He went and was able to work with the police incognito. They caught Al Capone, they put him in prison, but Al Capone's dying words were, I will get you. For one year, Fast Eddie was able to live as a free man. He made a lot of changes in his life. He uh, really embraced his son but almost one year later to the day, he was killed. Uh, Al Capone did take him out. But when Fast Eddie was found, they removed what was in his pocket, his pants pockets, and there were a rosary, a crucifix, a religious medallion, and a poem that had been just really worn, worn out. And the poem said, the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own, live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in time, for the clock may soon be still. You see, I think he knew. But even a man such as this was able to change because love entered the scene. And when we acknowledge whether that love comes through our love for someone else, love begins to change us. And we bring, if we bring awareness to ourselves, 
Love will continue to change us. It will grow us and allow us to have courage and do things we thought we could never do. And it will use us in ways we thought we may never be used. There's a second story that during World War II, a lieutenant commander, his name was Butch O'Hare, was a fighter pilot assigned to an aircraft, the Lexington in the South Pacific. One day, Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare's entire squadron was sent on a mission. And after he was airborne, he looked at the fuel gauge and realized that someone had forgotten to, to fuel up his tank. And so he didn't have enough fuel to complete the mission, so he knew that he would have to abort and go back to the carrier. So reluctantly, he dropped out of formation and began to head back. As he was returning to the mother ship, he saw something. He saw a squadron of enemy bombers coming towards the American fleet and the American fighters would be completely defenseless, completely wiped out. He couldn't reach his squadron to bring them back. He couldn't warn them of the approaching danger. And so in his mind, there was only one thing he could do. He mustered the words, God help me. And he turned his plane and began to just dive like a madman into that formation, trying to clip off wings, do whatever he could. He so confused them that that whole um, fleet of enemy planes, some went down, but they turned around and left. So when he got back to the ship, the mother ship, they were able to see from the cameras what took place on his plane. And on February 20th, 1942, he became the Navy's first ace of World War II as the first naval aviator to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was recognized as a man that had good character, loved other people, appreciated and enjoyed serving. A year later, at the age of 29, he was killed in an aerial combat. But his hometown would not allow the memory of that heroic action to die. And so you may not know that you know him, but if you've ever been to Chicago's O'Hare Airport, it is named after him. As a matter of fact, if you go between Terminal 1 and 2, you will see a statue in honor of Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. But the story doesn't stop there. This Lieutenant O'Hare was the son of Mafia's Fast Eddie. That in one lifetime, in the span of one lifetime, that much change, one who had been out selfish through the love of a little boy was able to change enough that a boy grows up to become a man that would give his life for others. I tell you this story because there's so much more available to us that is always seeking to change us. You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to do it alone. And I hope that these three faces of God have expanded your willingness and awareness to relate and integrate. Because the beauty is when we can see all of these, that, that God is infinite, God is intimate, and God is I am. Sometimes I may lean more on this, sometimes more on this, but always holding sight of all of these. The mantra this week is, I am that I am. I had a woman in the last service tell me afterwards that she drives, she's been doing this for some time, she said on her drive to work, she plays a particular CD with music she likes, and she literally envisions the I am presence filling her, going through her, down into the earth, and all the way to work, she says, I am that I am, I am that I am. She told me it has changed her life. It's created a flow, it's created a better work atmosphere. That's our practice this week, I am that I am. And we share this song with you to help bring and anchor it into your awareness. And it goes like this. Would you give us the words? I am that I am Has set me To this now moment Here I am I am that I am Set me to this now moment. Here I am to be 
Close your eyes and allow yourself to sit up a little more right, rightly in your seat. To feel the strength of your body. To connect in awareness with the breath, how your body breathes you. How there's this dynamic flow of inhale and exhale, of taking in and expressing, receiving and expressing, receiving and expressing. So it is with this dynamic of life that all of life is sourced by the one source. And the many forms of life show up as their unique representation of life. And it is just that, a representation, a representation, a representation of life in its many colors, its many shapes, its many forms. And though any individual representation of all that is doesn't represent or exhaust it, it fully encompasses it. You see though, all that we are, we are not in form a tree, we are not in form another person, but all that we are in form is made of God's stuff. We can never be disconnected. And there's nothing that we need to do to be approved by God. That's old understanding. The only thing that could ever cut us off from our good or from our blessings would be our own beliefs, our own how we relate to what's available, who we believe that we are. So we hold on very gently to what we believe and what we think to be true. And at the same time, we let go. And we create space for divine inspiration. We begin to acknowledge that those places in our life, those things within us that hurt, maybe there's an area in our life that we just can't seem to forgive. We realize that I, of myself, don't have it to know how to forgive. But there's a love that is big enough that flows through me that it can heal the pain to such an extent it doesn't sting the way it once did. It can heal me so much that eventually it doesn't have the impression, make the impression. When Jesus said, you can say to this mountain, be removed and it shall be removed, that's, a, that's about perspective. When you come to know yourself as all that is, there is no mountain bigger than that. The great I am is not just an idea, it is an energy, it is a spirit. It changes us, it grows us. It's what it means to become a new creature. It's to literally be transformed to such an extent that we are indeed a new and improved version of ourselves again and again and again. There's no need to be born again there is a need to be reborn again and again and again every day, every breath and with this great I am presence comes a joy comes a spirit of freedom for we realize that those things that we thought were impossible now become possible those places within us that we thought would never change now become changeable the ability to discern, to see the spiritual gifts that seem so mystical and out of our reach now become part of our everyday reality. It is not for a special few. It's simply for us to attune to the fullness of all that we are. If there's any area in your life that seems frustrated or closed down or 
big giant question mark. Be fully present to it. It's I am that I am. I am that I am. There is that within me which knows what is needed. There is that within me that can become the quality that I am seeking. There is that within me. I am that I am. I am that I am. Has sent me to this now moment. Here I am. I am that I am has sent me to this now moment here I am to be the voice and to be the heart through which heaven is made known level at an emotional level it softens me it makes me it molds me it allows me to become an instrument of light and of love it allows me to presence and embody those qualities that I seek it allows me to see really see the divine spark within all creation It gives me joy. It sets me free. It teaches me what it means to die before I die before because I realize that there's no need to life is not about seeking to save it that this life is about fully expressing. And as I seek to be fully expressed, I realize there is no end, there is no exhausting that which would express itself in and through and as me. allow the boundaries of my being to become loose. I see myself as this point in time, a channel, a sacred vessel, presencing, being presenced by all that is. And this joy and delight surely will fill my soul. It is palpable, it is real. So we bring to our awareness anything anyone that we are holding in prayer. And we see in the midst of that I am that I am. That which is not bound by any limitation but is always willing to express more light, more love. More light, more love in its many manifestations. May we be individuals, may we be a spiritual community that is anchored in the awareness of who we are. May we be attuned to the vibration of light and love where that is our greatest desire and our greatest joy. May we be instruments and embodiments of this to such an extent that it does create heaven on earth, heaven in our earthly body and heaven in this earth. We are an expression of all that is. And so it is. I am that I am. has sent me to this now moment here i am i am that i am has sent me to this now moment here i am so pause 
at that moment and look around. Here you are in your I amness. So wiggle your fingers and your toes in that I amness and stand up to be the voice and to be the heart through which heaven is made known. Yes. Yeah.